Hey there, uh, New Breed Tribe. Welcome this morning. We are here to talk about a sort of a, the a third in a series of discussions about what's going on uh, in the earth and how that in fact uh, impacts inflation. And then what is God saying about how to prepare for that? And last week we spent uh, much of our discussion time on spiritual preparation and continuing along those lines this week, we want to move into tying that to natural preparation or, or in implementing it physically, uh, implementing it with between people, uh, putting our faith into action, if you will. And sometimes we can lose our head in both directions. We can either get so super spiritual we don't do much, like to help people and touch the physical realm. Um, and then sometimes we could be so crazy with trying to serve and do that we lose the plot, forget the uh, gospel message, and we get overburdened and, um, you know, we, we cannot achieve all of what heaven wants us to achieve. So it's about tying these things together. That is actually a principle of the new breed of business is to tie the things in the spiritual realm or the heavenly realm and that power that God wants to release into the natural man and power and, and impacting people here on the earth. It's the combination that God is looking for. Um, and that is where we find our balance. So we're going to talk about that combination today. I threw in here a number of truths that just came to mind uh, scripturally, which is in the write-up in the post, but it was also in your emails. Um, I want to see if anyone had a reaction to that. I, wanted, I, I also wanted to kind of jump into, we can never, I put in here, do, um, there is no getting around these and other spiritual truths. And we're talking about man cannot live by bread alone, but has to depend on God, has to depend on the word of God, the, what comes out of the mouth of God. And I love this phrase um, that Corey Tim Boom apparently coined, and I wasn't aware of that, but I just heard it from a friend of mine, Dan Fox, who's a worship leader. You may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. So that's a telling statement because what that gets into is like sometimes faith doesn't get activated until we put ourselves at risk, meaning we throw ourselves in the hands of God or we find ourselves in circumstances like the Jewish people did in World War II uh, where there's nothing we can do of our own natural man strength where we, we may have been like, captivated in internment camps or protecting the Jewish people as Corey Tim Boom did and then going um, – a, you know, and, and being persecuted as they. So in those circumstances, we realize, wow, we have to depend on God, but there he is right there. There he is. He shows up and that's a principle. Um, sometimes the greatest miracles happen in the greatest positions of there's no other way out. <clears throat> um, I put in here too the Daniel reference to when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made the vow, we will not bow down to your gods, Nebuchadnezzar. We will not bow down to your statue of gold, which represents wealth. Um, and whether we live or die, we are going to go into, we're, we're not going to do that. And Jesus, of course, rescued them. So I say here, there's no getting around these and other spiritual truths. There, no more than there is no effective strategy in the Lord in the absence of prayer. Sometimes that's not, a, not only what we need, it is exactly what we need. And I also put in there the reference um, uh, to, uh, you know, when we were talking about the seventh day of Passover just as before we came on to record. And here is uh, that reference. Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that the Lord will bring you today. So was it by Moses's power that um, the sea was separated. No, it was by God's power. He had to obey and act. And that's where we see this activation of faith into action. Um, but make no mistake about it. The, it was God who saved them. There's another reference, like that's another famous or classic quote of, out of the scripture. I think it's Chronicles 2020, um, where Jehoshaphat is appealing to the Lord, like all these armies are about to crush us. And God just says, just stand firm and watch what I do. And so this, this really underscores the, you have to have a spiritual foundation. There's no way around that. And in fact, sometimes that's really all we need. But then many other times there's the 
obedience step where we're being shown, activate your faith and go and do this thing that I'm saying to you. I will be with you as you do it. And I will release power as you put your hand to it. Um, so that's, that's where we're focused today is taking action. What does that look like? How, how do we build on spiritual faith? So I put in here some great scriptural stories that, that, that illustrate this, the combination of the two, the heavenly understanding, and then the taking of the action in obedience, mm. and then doing something that's seemingly impossible. Noah built an ark with his family, took over 120 years to do it. Joseph built the storehouses with others, was an outstanding administrator, collected grain throughout Egypt for seven years, and then masterfully administered its uh, release to feed people over the next seven. So a 14-year plan. He heard it through that, through um, the Pharaoh's dream and then implemented it by the grace of God. Joshua took the promised land by warfare. You, they, the, the Israelites didn't just wander in and started drinking uh, the milk and eating the honey. They had to do what God was saying for them to do in war. And uh, that was costly. And that required great sacrifice and obedience. Uh, David conquered. I have a misspelling here. I, it, my spell checker changed it to Jesuits. But I believe it's the Jesuits were occupying what is now Jerusalem. And it was a high hill and a, and a fortified fortress that no one else could defeat. But David, listening to the Lord, did so. Uh, Moses confronted Pharaoh, not out of his own abilities. Uh, he was, in fact, in that desert discussion in the burning bush with God. He said, I'm not worthy. I'm not the guy. Like, how could I do this? But he obeyed and took action. Nehemiah rebuilt the wall in his faith and desire and uh, the king uh cyrus or whoever the king was at the time like released him to go do that job with others Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple in a similar fashion so this is where we see faith and being spiritually in tune with what the lord is saying in heaven but then acting on the earth and releasing heaven's power also by our action in a sense it's like a lever so when we hear of the Lord and act like Moses raised his rod over the Red Sea, then it parted. That's like a lever, like the, the, the obedience act, the, the taking a step forward, not shrinking back and surrendering to the Egyptians, standing firm and looking forward, believing, having faith, that, that caused this great natural event to occur of the splitting of the sea. And then going into that by faith, the masses crossing over. Um, so that's that's the background of our discussion today. And I just wanted to uh, open it up to you guys, the floor here for this discussion. Over the past few weeks, I've had some people call me offline and talk to me about, man, these dreams, like the, the inflation that's coming, the war that's here, things are crazy how will we make it through it's like fear can rise up and and cause us to wonder and, and 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 almost get overwhelmed but i think if we return back to the spiritual foundation knowing even with nothing god can help us like Corey ten boom said and witnessed and acted out um so we, when we start with that knowledge and understanding we can move out and do things we can do things by faith we can be shown to do things like now, preparation time for what's going to happen in the days ahead. And if we're hearing rightly from heaven, God will help us and do that work. Meaning not God will help our idea, but God will be, be always back. There's a prophetic power behind every prophetic word, right? So if God is doing something or saying something, he then releases the power as part of the package if we're obedient and we step out in faith. So what's on your hearts and minds maybe you've been given creative ideas of where you felt the lord has said to take an action we of course talk about here on the new breed of business the storehouse vision which is very all encompassing if you will in terms of preparation through local community um, we tend to focus at times on the act of lending as god's way of helping people as a form of investment but it's actually a greater concept. It's a concept of the community coming together and trusting God together, pooling resources together to, in order to accomplish the work and in order to 
Um, use that leverage from heaven to release that what God wants to do in order to help people. And out of that understanding comes also an overflow. And that overflow is an abundance where we can freely we've been given and freely we can give. So what's been stirred up in your hearts? What's uh, even perhaps provoked you uh, in some of these discussions? There were other references I put up in the post and the email to uh, that touch on the agricultural aspect of, of preparation and how to return back to the creation points of how God uh, functions here on the earth and returning to some of those principles. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. And also we have in here um, the things that are impacting the world right now in terms of the, the monetary systems, the shift to payment in gold and other hard goods uh, for or, or, or hard value, physical value things instead of fiat currency. And again, we're not to get overwhelmed with worry, but we are to understand what's going on and prepare. Um, and God has a way of dealing with this, addressing this. We don't just have to go down with the ship, um, the ship of economic uh, change. You know, So those things that have been strong, that in the future will not be strong, which I would argue is our Western US currency and markets, those things are gonna be weakened. But that's okay. Like God has a plan. So let's talk about it. Grant Barry, good to see you, brother. Got your hand up. Go Amen. ahead. Amen. Amen. Greg. Um, you know, well, first of all, for a moment, you know, think about what you're doing on New Breed. Um, oh my word. I mean, just the concept of coming out of Babylon right? It's one thing, you know, it's, it's one thing to come under conviction and then to come into a place to break it off. But then there's a renewed mind. And, you know, it's a process. Um, you know, the Lord is beginning to lead us down this path. How do we do this? You know, um, and what we're discovering every week is that we need to talk. We need to dialogue um and come into a place of, of understanding so thank you greg for your leadership in this place it's the same thing you know um joseph uh, i'm sure it took a while to organize all the bonds and everything uh, and and the structure and all the people in order for the you know for the land to move into that place of storage for those seven years it's the same thing with the romans 911 project we're coming into a new wineskin. And I think there's a great need, Greg, for us to realize and understand that this renewing of the mind is, is, is a process and it's a journey. I mean, I'm, uh, there's a lot of the stuff about the, you know, the financial stuff that you talk about. You know, I mean, I was a businessman and an entrepreneur, but I wasn't in finance. You know, and I know your, your background is in finance and there's a lot of stuff I just don't understand. And I'm just trying to comprehend and get my mind around some of these things, you know, praying into them. Um, it's the same thing with the Romans 911 project. Why did, you know, it go off, you know, for two to three years to finish all this work? You know, we talked about it just the other day. You know, there's the there's. But there's such a need. Uh, I think one of the things we should be, uh, maybe we should pray about uh, before we end the call today, is for the body to recognize the need to embrace the, the pathway that the Lord is establishing and that it is a journey. It takes time and there's a place of renewal um, in the new wineskin that is most necessary. And uh, actually, this is one of the greatest challenges I'm having with the Romans 911 project. I mean, the Lord said it had to be excellent, and it is. It is excellent. And, it, and it's an incredible teaching project that transforms uh, um, and takes the body of Messiah deeper into John 17, love and unity, and really puts us on that path and, and strengthens us along the way in that journey. 
But the challenge that we're having, in a sense, is to for the body to understand the significance of of taking the time to begin to enter this process. And I think it's the same thing with the new breed. You know, it's like one thing to recognize it. It's it's another thing to come into confession and repentance. But then there's this process of renewing, of renewing our minds and um, coming out of the old wineskin. And, and I, I just have to be honest, the more I think about moving into the new wineskin, the more I realize how much the old wineskin still has grips on the way I think and the way I operate. I can't help myself. <laughs> You know, it brings me to a greater place of brokenness where I say, God, you know, help, help me, teach me, you know. So sometimes they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but I think we're at a place, you know, uh, in the kingdom where we all need to humble ourselves and realize that God is doing something very new and that it's going to take time and dedication and discipline. And this is one of the things um, that we're we're really beginning to focus on in Reconnection Ministries is to really emphasize uh, the need uh, to begin to uh, to get on this path and 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 strengthen this journey that we're all all on. Amen. Amen. And that's a good way of putting it. And for those of you who don't know, my friend Grant Barry, and the, he mentioned his Romans. 911 project you could google that uh, also uh, go to his website i think it's reconnection reconnection ministry or is there about we can put it in the chat or you can grant um <clears throat> but the point being god is shifting the church we have to realize that so all of what's going on in the earth is has been prophesied in the bible right i don't think there's any denying that um, we have to recognize, though, that God is shifting the church. He's moving us into this prepared bride, a bride without spot or wrinkle. What that means is we need a new wineskin, and God is building a new wineskin. In fact, he's tearing down some of the old structures of how church has been done, where this become less and less flexible, and those structures have to be dealt with in order to make space for the new thing that God's doing. Um, why do we need that new thing? Because in the days ahead, the challenges are going to be that much greater where we really can't have kind of a compromised model in order to accomplish what the Lord wants. So there's many aspects to this reformation and new wineskin. And Grant is focused on how the, 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 the Jews, Jews and Gentiles need to come together in God's plan for this reunited church. If we don't do that, we're not going to be able to do to be obedient to the Lord and see him move. And likewise, if we don't move out of Babylon, if we don't move out of uh, idolatry of money and, and, and sort of that Greek mindset of intellectually solving things only, um, depending on self-strength and kind of a survival survivalist mentality, um, you know, where God is clockmaker. If we don't work, if we don't come out of this, these notions um we, we won't have a, we won't have a chance and so this remnant is really important and it's multifaceted we focus most of our time here on the economic things but they all come together they integrate and um so i appreciate what you're saying here and the truth of that and like when we look at what's possible just to shift a little bit um you know i, I put a picture here of this uh the simple note that we actually touched when Merrick and I went up to the Berkshires uh, and visited with the Berkshires founders, which is uh, which is a think tank that's out there in Western Mass, but they're acting in terms of what can be done, where they're not, where in fact people creatively were moved into an area where they started thinking, hey, I can't repay my debt because of inflation at the time of, I think it was like fertilizer and seed or something. And so what I'll do is I'll raise money by issuing these, um, which what were called a farm preserve note. It was kind of a hand drawn <laughs> yeah, note, really. uh, 
um, when someone couldn't yeah. solve their inflation issue, they literally creatively yeah. said, okay, well, we'll save the farm to buy the seed uh, to get the fertilizer and you could substitute anything you'd like there. And this is not yeah. some super spiritual example. This is just a practical example of thinking differently, breaking out of the mindsets of everything has to be done through our money, our U.S. dollar. Um, and, you know, so then they, the community like stood up and said, okay, we will give you the money to go do those things. And in return, you're giving us a currency, another kind of money that we can redeem in vegetables. And so this is like literally a agriculturally backed currency that they creatively created in this one situation. Mm -hmm. That just gives us a simple example. It doesn't have to be, you know, some, uh, great technological exploit or incredible this is almost impossible kind of thing to do this is literally where people are thinking outside of the box and people are helping each other so i'm going to see if i can throw this little picture up on the screen greater so you can check it out if you didn't see it in the email but it's kind of funny it's like it's a little bit of uh comedy with um with the tragedy of going through inflation with the wonderful solution of people helping each other how about that like <laughs> we would actually help each other instead of just run to the bank go get a job try to make some more money wow everything's going up so i just need more income like well maybe that's not the answer that's the answer that the world would want uh or that's the answer that the devil would want because he wants to enslave us further those are the principalities and power so this this thing that grant's talking about like our mindsets like we can't sometimes envision what god is talking about is because there's literally a power behind the um, convincing of people there's no other way but the current way so just suffer yeah. just be yeah. a slave just um you just have to make more money or somehow buy less stuff like that's the only answer and you're on you're on that slave trade you're in you're on that um internment camp if you will of the mind which is uh, fear based um and we we need to recognize and come out of that america got your hand up go ahead some some really interesting threads being created here greg this so that example that you gave out of the berkshires i think uh was initiated like 40 years ago in the early 80s yes so imagine that i mean this one little well this one farm really needed some help and assistance and was extremely creative and was able to show others yes. that hey, you want to be a part of our production, help fund the production. We'll, we'll, we'll give you the produce. <laughs> you know, so I think uh, those things will be coming back into vogue. I really believe that's the kind of thing that desperate people will, will do because what's the cost of fertilizer these days? It's, it's up 35, 40, 50%, even more than that in some places. So it's, it's becoming difficult to really, go through the, the farming process um, with bank loans that can, may not cover your cost of doing business. So this is a, it's a beautiful way of doing that. And um, I take my hat off to those people in, in the Berkshires who did that. But, you know, just to come back into the, the fullness of that, uh, Rachel Moriarty, who Greg and I met with along with Chris, uh, Chris Adams, they recently tied their Berkshire's uh, package with the U.S. dollar, and they did it through a digital currency online. And I called Rachel. Uh, I haven't spoken to you about that, Greg, but I spoke to her about two weeks ago. And I asked her what was the purpose behind all of this because what they did was to pull the incentive out of the, on the consumer side and gave it to the business interests. So because the consumer no longer has an interest in, let us say, they can't buy a hundred, uh, let's say. 100 Berkshires for $95. They can only buy it dollar for dollar. And so it's really the shift in focus has moved to the business side where they want to create more interest in the business community, but without developing the consumer piece of it, I don't see how that can happen. So I, I really challenged Rachel on, on my call with her. I said, you're moving away from the consumer back to the business guy, but without the consumer's incentive to go do what the business guy wants to do is, is, is trade in Berkshires. There's no incentive to move forward with it. So basically what she was saying is that the business people will provide incentives, provide discounts, provide some way of 
encouraging consumers to go at it. But her main focus, Greg, believe it or not, was that the 20 something, the 30 something crowd in that part of uh, Berkshire, Berkshire County were motivated to get the app. That was her, right. her answer to me. They want the app. I, I mean, I want to trade in, in digital currency. So it's really cool. Uh, I mean, but is that going to grow a business, or grow the community? I really quite doubt it. <laughs> yeah, I really so I, I'm glad you bring this up because when we met with them, I picked up on that right away, which had to do with, um, uh, uh, or, uh, what's her first name? Last Rachel? name Wang. Uh, there's oh, Rachel uh, Moriarty, Fenny. but there was also Fenny Wang. Yes. And Fenny was the implementer. She was the one bringing the technology right. to the table. Mm -hmm. And so they love that. They're like, yeah, we need to go digital. We got to bring this into the 21st century. <laughs> that all makes sense. But when you lose your saltiness, what's the point? And the saltiness is back to the basics of this 40 years ago, redeemable note in plants and produce, a Berkshire farm preserve note. I love it. But they're losing that component right they at are. the very time where it's so needed. Yes. And it's like, you know, it's just, it's the next generation putting their stamp on things, but they're forgetting what got them there in the first place? Why did Schumacher, who was a Christian, by the way, why did he care about this stuff, about local community? He cared for these baseline reasons. We can never forget about the deli dollars or the farm reserve <laughs> note, which are yep. so simple, but yep. so profound. Why are they profound? Because they get us away from this um, slavery dynamic, this system that will captivate people and cause them to depend on things that are going to become harder and harder of a treadmill to sustain. So we got to break mm -hmm. out from that. We have to have an, an alternative. And guess what? The church has been called to do it. That's why it doesn't bother me too much, although it's tragic that maybe the Schumacher Center isn't headed mm -hmm. in that direction, but they've given us something that, that we can see and understand from the Lord's perspective. It is the church's inheritance to move into these areas um, and to be creative and out of the box thinking. So mm. thanks for that. And um, I'm going to turn it Could to I, you, Gary. Go, go ahead, Merrick. Just wanted to add one more thing to that. I, I think um, something that Doug Jaden uh, has positioned, uh, even in, in the last discussion that we had, I think it was last week, he talked about how food security is going to play probably the key role in how we move forward in developing strong communities. And um, just let me give you one quote from uh, a recent email he made. Uh, Food production and supply chains are, in the, are the root source of all value because they are the, the originating source of all economic energy on earth. Without food, we can't produce, we can't live, we can't survive. So if you look at God's perspective, and Greg's talked a lot about the land and how important the land is to God, and he's, he's positioned it extremely well in, 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 obviously, Genesis 1. Go and replenish the earth. He gave that dominion command to Adam. Go cultivate and, and tend the, the land. So food, the food production side of things, I think, is going to be key, very significant in local building, rebuilding local economies. Yeah. And I... Uh, find and I'm relating to people who guys who are and women who are in the secular world who really understand these principles and I'm beginning to spend some time with them and, and walk through this and say okay well how do we develop food security how do we work with the farms I mean there must be 30 or 40 farms in the Monadnock region here and they're all part of this network of um, how do we work together to bring forth substance from these farms to enable people to live and survive. So there's the, the local currency with respect to food production, I think is very significant. I think it's going to come alive again. Absolutely. And it's, it's always been historically significant and will continue to be. And we, we can never get away from the earth that God has given us. Like that's, he's been given it to us to steward and, and, and in some ways, like our fiat based system, our, our sort of financial based system um, is perverting that, right? We're, we're, we're stripping away things from the land. We're not doing things in the best way for the future of the land uh, just to get more near term profits, really. I mean, a lot of yep. the companies are publicly traded and they look for near term profits. So they want to get people hooked on fertilizers and seeds. 
well, yep. that movie Garden Return to the Return to Eden, which I put back in the to email. yeah, right back to that, Eden. Yes. That was back to Eden. Thank you, Doug's. Doug's uh, brought that up last week. Um, and by the way, you can check out Doug's stuff on I think it's thrive21.org. Um, right. and to Merrick's point of returning back to the agricultural aspects. Um, I I think what's what's uh, important out of that whole thing is to realize like um, it's a trick of the enemy to get us away from the land. It's a trick of the enemy to just exploit it and separate it and kind of like husk out just these benefits but then sort of like crushing the land as part of it that's that's also an environmental thing but the back the back to eden um uh, return to eden uh movie which by the way it's not a perfect documentary my wife found it very repetitive but the core thing that they talk about in there is how you if you manage the soil as god gives you wisdom you don't need fertilizer you don't need these extra yep. things you can do it just using nature itself. And I, that was amazing. Yeah. That, Wasn't that it? Was an amazing yeah. aspect. He used, he kept emphasizing the use of mulch, chewed up bark and other things that are organic on the forest floor and watching, let's observe how nature works itself. Now let's deploy that in wisdom for how we could do this differently. And it's far less labor intensive, far less water intensive. Like you don't have to water things the same way. So beautiful uh, expose as to like just if we listen to the lord and do what he's doing so much better so much more efficient um Amen. so much more labor and cost effective uh gary go ahead yeah i have to jump off so because i have to go to another meeting but um one of the things that i think that's going to be important it started in the discussion early is that <clears throat> you and I'm, I'm going to put in the link, a, a chat, a, a link to a video that Dave Smithers did with Dave Warren about in time communities and um, to combat fear, you've got to, to be meeting with people of like mind. Now we're doing this here, but what if your electricity goes out? We wouldn't be having this meeting. And so if you're not developing locally in time communities where you have people that are like-minded um, you because that's where you develop relationship it says in scripture in hebrews 10 it says do not forsake the gathering together as you see the day drawing closer we've already come through all we're past the point of believing that the day is drawing closer i think everybody's put that in their back rearview mirror but you've got to be meeting together uh, with people locally that if you had to walk to their house because there was no gas or because you can't develop a currency around when there's no economy to, to apply it to and so one of the things that's very important, if you're going to combat fear, I need people in my life to stir myself up to encouragement. That's what it says in scripture, to love and good works. We're not to stop being salty just because these days are drawing closer. And so I think a lot of times we're talking about the conceptual framework of architecture of a currency when we've never developed an economy to apply it to. So we have been spending a lot of time developing small groups in what we call end time communities. And they're architected a lot like David is saying, he calls them Jesus circles, but I'll send this to you all just because I, I think it's a worthy video to watch um, because you have to develop economy before you apply currency. Uh, I have to trust my neighbor. I have to believe that we're in this together. I'm gonna share my food, whatever that looks like. Um, and God will help you figure that out to Greg's point. Uh, what he wants to architect, and it'll be different in every area. Uh, I, I, I kind of chuckled at the currency you showed because Kane Kane was relying on his work in the field also in in, <laughs> in crops we trust. Uh, it's not in crops we trust, and that and I know that that's not intended of by course. it. But it's got to be. It, it's got to be. Sometimes we're and we're not going to muscle people to change their minds. Some are going to come along, and some aren't. But I would encourage at least everybody on this call. You need an in-time community. Uh, I just came back from a meeting last night, and somebody came back from Texas, another meeting. There's just stuff going on all over, but their primary focus right now is to develop an in-time group of people that they're close to locally. And otherwise, you can get trapped in your house, and that's really when fear and doubt creeps in is when you've got no one to talk to that's close to you or living within geographically within your area where God's called you to be. Um, 
one of the things that has been exciting to watch happen in Florida is we had someone down here get a vision in December, Grant and Holly know them, but know her, but the Lord said 67 counties, which Florida has, they've assembled the intercessors in 61 of the 67 counties. Um, and every one of them has developed an intercessor group in every, in every county in the state of Florida. And they're hoping to have all 67. There's over 400 intercessors now, and they're having a conference in September, but they're gathering people together, but they're not trying to tell each other what each county is doing. They're gathering people that are interceding in their county for what God's purposes are in that county. And that's, I'll show you my faith by my works. That's not going out and doing things and hoping God will be pleased with it. We all know that that verse and the exhortation is an exhortation that my faith is evident because I'm doing things because I heard God tell me to do it. And I went and did it. And he manifested his glory in the midst of it. And so um, I think these places already exist. I don't think it's a real big lift to get them because God's already at work advance. But I really would encourage everybody, uh, one, to watch the video David did, because I think he gives a good, at least a good architecture of what he calls Jesus circles and why these communities will be important in the last days. And I really would encourage everybody to consider development. We've seen fruit out of them where God does speak to us about someone doing earth boxes or somebody doing this. In other words, we're processing how he wants us to develop the economy uh, within our area. And it's then I think that what will emerge out of that is the current season, a little bit about what we're talking about. And I apologize, I have to go, but um, uh, I just wanted to share that and hope you all be blessed in the, in the discussion. They're always fruitful discussions. Absolutely. So thank you, Gary. And go as you need to. That's Gary Crawford from Florida. They're working together in communities throughout the uh, counties and the surrounding areas of Bradenton, Florida, Manatee County. Um, and the other counties that make up the original Manatee County. Gary's point is well taken, which is why we're having this discussion today with faith without action is dead. Um, so we always need to take what we're hearing here, even if you're listening on this video uh, and see who, whose hand can I grab a hold of in unity, in John 17 unity, <coughs> who, are the, who are the networkers in unity in our community? And oftentimes, by the way, this is found in prayer circles and unity circles where we see the churches coming together. Uh, but who can I work with who gets this in my local area and we can start from a place? And the Jesus circles is really just a model for house church or marketplace church or any pop-up church, whatever you want to say, like church everywhere. That's what the Jesus circles are. So you can check out that video that Gary's got. Dave Smithers, I think, uh, was the one who made it. And really, that's the basis of this. So we in this call are like, you know, Gary's saying, hey, if the electricity goes out, we won't even be able to have this call. And while there's truth to that, that doesn't stop the need for the hub. We need hubs and spokes. The new wine skin is a hub and spoke model. We need to come together in a hub across geographies, but then we need to have the spokes <laughs> out to the local communities because the without the local community putting the hand into action there's really it's just a bunch of talk right so we don't want to be a bunch of talk we we want to move this in action we actually want to model this and help people um, understand it that's why we're doing what we're doing in new england with the kneecap that's why we're gary's doing what he's doing chris is doing what he's doing in texas in fact uh, even on this call right now we've got Susan and Kay, we're trying to work with Don Carl and in Detroit to see if we, there could be a coming together to help Kay. So we have to do this like locally. It's just like in the army, you can't win in the war room with a bunch of generals only. You have to have all the battalions and the foot soldiers and the different, and we don't want to forget the Navy ships and the Air Force, the prayer force. That's like your spiritual equivalent there. There has to be a concerted combined effort on all levels. And uh, speaking of which, here's Don right now. Um, so that's a little bit more about what Gary's talking about. Robin, you've had your hand up for a while, and then we'll go to consecrated Chris. Go ahead, Robin. Okay, well, I'm uh, definitely speaking as a, a student and not a teacher. We've just begun here, you know, um, 
a little over a decade ago, God gave us 125 acres and a vision of community. And we began building and recently we've seen you know, just an increase of people coming and joining together with us. And so we're learning this sustainable permaculture farming, learning as we're going. And each year we're um, increasing our yield, which, you know, the Lord's just blessing it. So in that learning, and so I'm, I'm not a farmer, I don't have a farming background, but we're just, you know, getting our hands in the dirt literally but in that we're, we're learning a lot about this this new way of farming that you were discussing and i would recommend if you haven't seen it there's a, a little movie a documentary called um i think it's the biggest little farm and um you know they began with this this idea of you know letting the farm be as they don't, they're not even Christians, I don't believe, but I would say as God intended, instead of what has become this new industrial way, which is fertilizer and huge machinery and then big silos. And so in that, in that learning, and there's another man, Joel Salatin, he's a believer, listen to some of his stuff. And so it seems like the industrial farming machine has really been so and captured or uh, enslaved, I would say, by the Babylonian system, same as the economics. And these farmers, many of them have become slaves to the system. So in order to succeed in that and compete to sell your grain to, you know, whoever, then it's, it requires this mass production, which means, you know, heavy fertilization and GMO seeds and combines and silos and big equipment so the farmers are so deeply indebted um that they're kind of trapped in that machine and um you know this heavy fertilization and those sort of things are destroying the crops which requires more and then now there's inflation of the fertilization and they feel like the war in ukraine is going to increase that and so just this call to come out of that system there as well and like I said, we, we have no background there, but we've been hearing that call as we've begun farming on a very small scale <clears throat> to move away, away from that system and go back to God's way of being good stewards of the land that he's given us. And that you can farm in a way that it doesn't deplete your soil and doesn't, but it's, it's, it actually builds the soil and builds the nutrient level and the topsoil and you're leaving as G Jesus tarries a um an inheritance in the soil and in the land to the next generation rather than this this industrial Babylonian way which is just stripping it and robbing it and um has made slaves of the people that work the land and then also the farmers so many farmers for the generation you know the goal was we work hard we send our kids off to college and now the generations are gone and the farmland has been split up and taken over by the industrial complex rather than, you know, I don't know, rather than that, that old system of your, you know, you're building your life, you're working the land, you're, it's fruitful, it's prospering, you're um, doing that and increasing it with the children. And so, you know, for us personally, we're really I feel like we're running to catch up which is you know not the truth but just in our own soul how God is doing to increase the community increase our capacity to give um how we can open the doors there but also doing that in a way that is a blessing to the land a blessing to the soil and that that our land our soil our produce our crops our labor is not a slave to Babylon but is free in God to do as he's called us to do Amen. And that's a good word and a complimentary one to how God farms or how he, uh, you know, has his creation and ecology respond. And our capitalistic profiting structure has taken us to the place where we were at today. Um, and we, we can go through all the ills of that. But thank God there's actually a generation now. You were talking about how in this, you know, we've lost the farming from generation to generation. Thank God there's actually a generation now, though, like my daughter, who cares about ecology, cares about how 
creation works together, how pollinators are needed, and you can have micro ecologies in order to better grow things more productively with less resources, just like you're saying, just like some of these documentary films are saying. And when we combine that with the help and blessing from heaven, we have an almost like unbeatable approach to returning back to productivity in the lands. And as part of that, I want to share, I put in the chat, um, sorry, not in the chat, but in the email, uh, a transformations video. Some of you who are on the Monday prayer calls have seen this video. This is George Otis Jr. Uh, who's the documentarian of those videos, if you've seen them. This one is about a city in Guatemala. And this city in Guatemala was a city filled with sin, all sorts of trouble. Then they had revival. They had awakening. They had a coming or returning back to God. And when the farmers returned back to God and implemented his principles and lived righteously, like as the righteousness of Christ, they started seeing the land supernaturally respond. That's why um, if you look at these carrots, I've never seen carrots that big. These carrots is kind of a blurry screenshot of the video. I thought the they were of the guy's limbs. Form. What's that, Chris? I thought they were limbs, so I'm glad they're carrots. <laughs> Those, are I carrots. They were Those are not artificial limbs. I did too. <laughs> Those, are Those are carrots the size of arms. Wow. But see, this is part of the solution. It's not all just, you know eco-friendly only it's really the combination and returning back to god's original intent and then also being in covenant with him covenant releases blessing that's a scriptural truth that results in a natural action um these vegetables they had were supernatural they didn't have some kind of wonder miracle grow a uh, chemical formula this was god showing up when the city that whole community locally turned to the lord and probably in that city more than maybe other cities a vast majority turned to the lord the bars started closing down the jails emptied out like people really turned to jesus and this was the result so it's a combination of all these things um thank you robin for that go ahead chris yeah um if I could ask two follow-up questions to Robin before I share. Um, Robin, I was just wondering, where is your farm and how many do you have working with you and kind of your kingdom family? Um, our farm is in Western North Carolina in the foothills. And presently we have three, we have six families working together and three more wanting to come on board. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, really awesome. And, cool. and I'm sorry. Go ahead. You can just turn down your like music in the background. Oh, yeah, awesome. sorry. Um, actually, my my question was because I would like to share the video that uh, Greg just referenced. So I didn't know if you could drop a link to it. Yep. Or if you did, okay, appreciate it. Yeah, hold on, let me get it for you. It's in the email the too, by the way. Yes, yeah, it's in the email, the transformation video. It's an amazing, encouraging story. Uh, here you go. So, um, Greg, as you're sharing that picture of the carrots, it reminded me of my dream last night where fish were being taken out of the water that were just like, you know, the size of, um, I don't know, maybe more like swordfish. And, and it was like a reminder. It was this river. And we live right by a river in, in Rhode Island, um, but it wasn't that river in the dream. And it was like, but we had to give, we had to give the fish away first before the giant fish started coming out of the river. And, um, and I just realized like, man, it's, it's been uh, like, I haven't, we were missionaries in YWAM over the course of 10 years for about five years, full-time youth with a mission. And there's just such an extreme sense of generosity, supernatural generosity, like the Acts 2 and 4 community. Um, people just, you know, giving their laptops to one another, like professional cameras and thousands of dollars. And, you know, we're all missionaries, but some of us are coming from maybe working uh, and then out and, and we have a savings stored up and God calls us to give it all away. So um, 
so it's been uh, you know 10 years since i transitioned out uh from from ywam and so i haven't had to give from a place of sacrifice for a long time now and in the dream i just realized like wow this is hard for me to do again um i haven't exercised this muscle for a while but when jonathan Barry was talking about the new wine skin and like he's realizing it's hard to come into the new wine skin and you know has the mentality from the old wine skin I, I think that's kind of what my dream i was wrestling with and um i've been reading and rereading through the gospel of john the last couple of weeks and this morning i was rereading the wedding at cana and kind of it, when when he goes when jesus they come back to cana later um in john um it's interesting because john writes in there the place where the water was transformed into wine like like I, I i don't know if the reader needs a reminder of that or i was kind of thinking uh, it's john 4 46 so he came again jesus came again to cana in galilee where he had made the water wine and at capernaum there was an official whose son was ill so i had two thoughts that came from that verse one John and the rest of the disciples will never go to Cana again without thinking, hey, this is where we came to the wedding and Jesus turned the water into wine. And just how like we need those places in our lives, like physical places where when we enter that town or that city or that park, whatever Jesus miraculously did, like whoever we're with, hey, did I tell you about the time when Jesus turned the water into wine for us? Um, or, you know, at this wedding. Um, and it just kind of hit me this morning, like the, the str strategic timing that, you know, the beginning of chapter two, it says on the third day, there was a wedding at King uh -huh. of Galilee. Why, why is it the third day? I, I've heard that, you know, the parallels to the resurrection, but um, it, it's, it's saying this, this is after just three days from John the Baptist saying, behold, the lamb of God and two of dis his disciples John, the brother of James, and Andrew, the brother of Peter, um, start going after Jesus. And then they bring Peter and James. And then Jesus calls um, Philip, who calls Nathaniel. So within three days, Jesus has six of his disciples gathered, at least six. I mean, it could be more. It doesn't say the others weren't there. But, um, you know, Matthew seems like he was kind of called a little bit later um, in the Gospel of Matthew from the tax collector booth, but at least six of them are there when he turns the water into wine. And, um, and so it's like a pretty quick gathering. Um, and you see at the end of that story, um, verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. So at this point, his mother and his brothers we're actually following Jesus. Maybe they didn't believe like his disciples believed, but uh, you better believe that they would have been talking about how he just changed the water into wine because his mom, I mean, she kind of instigated it. And so like this would have been a sign not only for his disciples and the servants, but also for his mother and his brothers. And so why did they stay in Capernaum for a few days? So I'm kind of combining the two questions that I had from 446 that Jesus came again to Cana in Galilee where he'd made water into wine and at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. So you see this little verse here in chapter two, verse 12, that they stayed a few days in Capernaum. Um, so they, the disciples must have been talking to people in Capernaum like, you wouldn't believe this guy that we're following. Like we, we think he's the Messiah. We think he's the anointed one. And he just literally changed water into wine. And so words getting around Capernaum so that by the time Jesus goes up to the Jerusalem for the Passover and then has the, you know, the cleansing of the temple, um, he does some more signs. John doesn't specify which in verse 23, Nicodemus has the conversation with them. The woman at the Samari Samaria has the conversation, the whole Samaritans. And then they come back to Cana and there's this, this um, official Roman official who's uh, come, well, I guess it doesn't say Roman, but it just says an official who's come down from Capernaum. So 
During that time, this official must have heard about Jesus from him stopping in Capernaum. So um, that, that's one thing I want to tie in. And the second thing is that Jesus did this first miracle, this first sign that John writes in his gospel. It's not in any of the other gospels, but he does this before he goes and cleanses the temple of, you know, ripping people off. Like, and, you know, the outsiders were supposed to come in, but outsiders didn't want to go to Jerusalem to sacrifice because they heard there was this reputation that it cost so much money that they didn't normally sell their animals that for that much money. So they're not even going to bother going to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, Jews or Gentiles, because they're getting so ripped off by going to Jerusalem. And so these Pharisees are literally keeping people from worshiping God um, or whoever, whoever is given authority to, to sh sell pigeons and, and doves. And so Jesus changes water into wine. He cleanses the temple and then he tells them the sign because John's all about the gospel. John's all about signs, raise this, you know, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. And so I just think, you know, like this whole talk about preparation is like, Jesus wants to give each of us a water into wine encounter at Cana. Um, whatever, whatever is happening this season, like as I've been reading John 4, you know, like the, you say the harvest isn't for four months, but I say, look for the harvest is now and you're going to, you're going to reap from what others have sown. And I think this summer, I just feel really strongly for the body, for, for, for all of us that Jesus is calling us to reap a harvest this summer of, of, of new disciples, of new believers. Um, he's bringing them into the kingdom. And some of them are servants at the wedding and they got the water and they see Jesus do this supernatural thing that he doesn't even make it known to the rest of the people at the wedding. He doesn't even, it's not talked about. It just says his disciples and the servants knew about it. And then we see the next verse is his mother and his brothers knew about it. So like, Jesus, I think Jesus wants to do some supernatural signs that we don't need to go proclaiming on the rooftops to the masses on Facebook and social media. But, but like Greg and Gary said before he got off, like we need to do this with our literal neighbors next door. Like my wife, we were, we had two of the neighbor boys over last night and I'll just end with this story. I know I've been talking a while, um, but they're, they're the grandsons uh, of um, our neighbors and our neighbors, he's, he, uh, they're like 70 and 67 and he's, um, he's half Jewish, uh, Russian Jew. Um, and so he's, I mean, he's like open to God, but not really, not really interested. And, and she's, uh, and it's like their fourth marriage or his fourth marriage. And she is Episcopal um, and she reads the gospels but she won't go to church uh, i've invited them so many times but they let their grandsons come to church and we've kind of like spiritually adopted their grandsons like the first time he asked us if we would take them and i laughed and he's like no i'm serious um because they had just gotten custody for the first time and now they their mom like officially signed over like she doesn't want custody of them in the future anymore so anyway we bring them to church with us to awana and we had him over for dinner last night. We have a French uh, exchange student staying with us right now, which is also a really cool thing because God called my wife to France with her cousins in France. And so since we haven't been able to go back to France now, he brought a French student who just started following Jesus three years ago. And his only experience with the church was going to Tizé in France, like staying for a week, twice a year for the last three years. And so now God's just brought up into our home for two months. He's at University of Rhode Island Bay Campus uh, studying oceanography after uh, previously having a master's in, in civil engineering. Um, and so anyway, God's just kind of like creating this community in our home. And we had the boys over and he made quiche and one of the boys helped them and my son helped them. And then we went to take the boys home last night at nine and ended up talking with uh, their grandparents. And Jeannie came over, um, my wife, that like, you got to bring the kids home to bed. And um, so I brought the kids home. She ended up staying and talking with, with um, Priscilla until one in the morning. 
And, um, and I've known for the last year and a half that God's kind of creating this supernatural community with this couple and with, um, you know, four or five other families in our neighborhood that we've, we've just really bonded with, uh, the last almost three years now. And, and so all, all I want to end with is like, this is just an example, maybe to stir you all up. If, if you're not seeing it already with your neighbors, that I think God's getting ready to perform a miracle in Cana for each of us. He, he, he's wanting to turn the water into wine. And so we need a new wineskin to experience that miracle. And like, whether it was Jonathan or whoever said, we might not know how to prepare and we actually can't prepare. It's just going to happen. And then we're like, okay, I, it's, I need a new wineskin now. Like I can't live in the old wineskin anymore. So anyway, that's my, <laughs> my Bible study hey, that, that I shared that, with you all. That's um, a good subplot there, Chris. So thank you for taking us through all those things. But in all seriousness, uh, I like how you're calling Grant Barry, Jonathan Barry. That's kind of oh. like the one new man of Jonathan Frizz and Grant Barry. <laughs> there you go. Together. Grant Barry and Jonathan but, Frizz, yes. But hey, um, I wanted to hit on a few <laughs> points here. In your dream, fish also could represent people. So keep that in mind. Like the people, the Christian symbol for, the, for Christianity was a fish for that reason. But the principle is what you're saying is right on, which is like, um, if I could trust you in the small things, I could trust you in greater things. So if we apply the principle of freely you've been given, now freely you give. The more sacrificial that is, the more God can release to us in order for uh, his purposes to prevail in our lives of, of blessing, but really to be a blessing onto others. And so that principle is true. And last week we spoke about the law of use and the law of multiplication. And what we see, I think, even as you were speaking, I kind of got a few maybe Holy Spirit hints on the wedding at uh, Cana. That first miracle that Jesus performed, if you remember, he said, it's not my time yet, woman, when he was speaking to his mom. And why is that? Well, the law of use is combined with the principle of giving and the principle of faith. So what was the law of use in that case? using of the water, do this with the water and obey what I'm saying for you to do. What was the gift? Why wasn't it Jesus's time yet? The gift was his death on the cross. That was the gift, the greatest gift of all. And he turned himself into wine, the shed blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, so that's good. the gift. The use was put this to work. The result was what? Multiplying. They multiplied and had much more wine than they had in the beginning. And that wine was really good too. So that's like that principle of law of use, law of uh, multiplication. But with the principle of giving and the principle of um, faith. So when you combine those things together, we see results. We see the bigger fish come forth. We see these things happening. And I guess final point I'll make to your several testimonies, which are great, by the way, is when we are in our local community, if you want to reach parents, if you want to reach families, Bless their children, help their children. We're seeing that right now at work here in Westport, where a wealthy community, a Jewish community, you want to touch um, families, like reach out to their kids. We've had families who want to, like you, you're saying, like, oh, take the grandkids to church. No, I'm serious. I won't go to church, but the grandkids, you take them. This is weird, but true. Like people will feel I'm not worthy to go to church, but I want my kids to grow up right. So I'm going to send them to the St. Paul Christian preschool. And because even though we won't go to St. Paul's church, we don't go to any church. We at least want our kids to have something better. And it's funny because like parents will feel guilty or like, I'm not worthy or like, oh, not for me, but I, I love how I was raised. So I want to, my first step of faith is to actually raise my kids. You help me with that. And then we'll go from there. And I think that's a beautiful principle of how to reach people um, is through their children. Uh, Susan, you've been patiently raising your hand. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there were a few, a couple of things along the way that I um, just wanted to mention. Um, 
uh, with the vegetable, the carrots that were, you know, the size of a man's arm. In Indonesia, there was a community that turned back to God and they were praying and really the whole town had turned back to God. And one day they saw, and I saw it on a video, but I don't remember the link or anything, but they saw this bubbling in the in the ocean. They didn't know what, they thought that this was something, uh, you know, a heat, something coming out of the ground, but it was when, when it settled, it was all this fish jumping, leaping out of there. And it had been dry for years and years and years and they hadn't had any fish. And all of a sudden when they turned back, the supernatural miracle of God multiplied the fish in their water. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing that I was um, in the beginning when we were talking about um, the Passover and the edge of, being at the edge of the Red Sea and you know the Israelites really having to trust God because they had nowhere else to go. Um, on the other hand, I heard a, a prophet speak about Pharaoh thinking the reason he followed them into the sea is because he thought he was God and it opened for him. And so, um, you know, I've heard a lot lately about portals opening, you know, over DC and the demonic coming in and everything. Well, what if that portal is really, you know, God and not the demonic? You know, what if what if God is about to do something, you know, um, that we can't see? And I just wanted to. And then the other thing is caring for the least of us, and 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 that includes with composting worms. And uh, these little red worms that I care for uh, now, and they're 99% water. So you gotta really, you know, keep them mo moist in a bin and give them a little food, but they multiply, multiply, and they could, they, they turn, you know, garden scraps and kitchen scraps and everything to dirt in, you know, a few days. And they're amazing and they multiply. And I, you know, Kay so, so teases me about them, but she does call me when it's going to freeze so I can bring them inside, you know, so, <laughs> so because they're 99% water, they'll freeze. <laughs> so, so you have to really, you know, take care of them, but they take care of you in the, in the end. So I just wanted to say people add there worms you to your garden. <laughs> That's like yeah. your, your worms are like mites, two <laughs> mites. So the, 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 the worm... <laughs> You know, what's what's cool about worms is they actually like um aerate the soil too like they they're kind of an amazing addition to the ecology of farming uh joel travis go ahead welcome good to see you you're muted joel if you're talking You're muted in you're you're not muted in Zoom. How about now? Not, there you go. There we can hear you now. That's good. Um, so I just there was two links I thought of from before conversations. I found something this week called Breadcoin, um, and it's being used to I think give the coins out to the poor or people on the street, and then they can redeem the coins at specific restaurants. Um, so it's a way to have people fund the coin and then the coins are given out to the poor and then on the back side the um, the restaurants are kind of paid through bread coin on the back end as they redeem the coins back so it's kind of a micro currency um, kind of one way but it is fostering you know um, effective giving to the poor and in benevolence in that way that's interesting. Uh, the next one is actually the same as one of my old college professors, and he's doing something called Aligned Works now. And it's essentially people that have a specific skill set that they want to use for either social enterprise type businesses or really they want to use it outside of their current job. And it's a way where they can give their time for some of the kind of equity of that company and i'm not sure if it's actual equity or if it's just like it's a social enterprise type endeavor so it's essentially lending time for the fruit of that endeavor um, and so i think as we're talking about farming i think robin i'd be interested in a way i feel like some shared work for produce is kind of a model that csas do and different things so just um as we talk about 
non-economic value exchanges. I feel like labor is one of those things. Um, so that was a thought there. And then I did plant a garden this week. Um, so we we're um, on the very micro scale, it's like a 12 foot by 12 foot. And then we're gonna try to put in a, a little greenhouse as well. Um, so I think for our two kids, just to see that experience of growth. And then even for us, I feel like it's the baby steps. Uh, you know, it's not um, enterprise ready. It's not, you know, not trying to sell it to anybody, but getting in that mindset of seeing what growth is, seeing what um, reject, like generative activities as a family unit are, um, it takes a great look at agriculture, as we're all saying. And so we're excited to just see what that is. And I think there's so many parallels to conversations we're having of in growing something, you know. So one, the multiplicated nature of seeds, we have the seed pack, you know, and we get, I think we got three tomato seed packs. Um, turns out you can only put about a quarter of one seed pack in the space that we allotted, you know. And so just the, the growth potential of a tomato plant seed is crazy. Um, and so just that, um, yeah, the, as things grow organically, the multiplicative nature of it is huge. So that was just one quick takeaway from that. Um, yeah, so I think that those are kind of my thoughts on this. Um, yeah, you're bringing up some uh, good points here and toward the end of your uh, story about the individually or family-wise, you guys are coming into the mindset and experimenting and, and trying the at-home garden. I think that when God calls us collectively, he also calls us individually. So we start individually to do these things. And then we also work together in community to do these things. And then we also network across geographies to do these things. That's the church at work. Um, and I think that that's, we need to do it at all levels. Gary's point is like, hey, if you, if you just go and network electronically only, that's not going to be sufficient. You've got to connect with people in your hometown or your locale. Absolutely. And then also, you know, if we, if we just sort of um, want to think about only what we could do with others, but we, we, we benefit the community when we start doing things individually and then can share a testimony, you know? So it's like all those factors working together are just important. And uh, so that's cool. Yeah, good to hear that. And, uh, you know, as always, like when we think about um, economics, depending on what terminology you want to use, it includes, we got to get out of the mindset of it's just dollars and like what currency do you use? It's, it, it's much more than that. It's just people working together with people exchanging things. Um, Doug sometimes calls this uh, uh, trading uh, rooms, um, Doug Jaden. Um, but what that really is, is just like, how can we work together? Like I have something to offer and you have something to offer. How can we work together? The simples of that are, are like barter. But the, the extension of that is just like we all have something to contribute and we're all valued. And the beauty is God's system of giving and receiving can, through an asymmetry of freely you have received, now freely give, it doesn't always have to be just sort of like a contractual arrangement only. It can be a giving and it can be a receiving too. So we can give our time. We can uh, receive someone else's fruit, um, someone else's um, resource. Um, and all these ways are valid economically in the Lord. So thank you for sharing that. Lucien, how are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm glad to see everyone that I can see and hear from everyone. Um, I was praying into today's meeting and God gave me Isaiah 50. And I just want to read this. And I have a few things to say. I'll try to speak quickly. Uh, where is the certificate of divorce by which I have sent your mother away or to whom of your, my creditors did you, I sell you? Behold, you were sold for your wrongdoings and for your wrongful acts, your mother was sent away. Why was there no one when I came and when I called, why was no one to answer? Is my hand so short that it cannot redeem? And the reason I believe God uh, 
wanted me to go there is because our team has been studying, and some of you don't know, I, I've taught at American Bible Society. I teach on mythic images in the ancient world, help people understand Babylon in a different way um, than your work here, but also in a similar way. But I wanted to read through for just a minute, a couple of scriptures quickly. They're going to be Jeremiah 7, 17 through 18, Jeremiah 44, 17 through 19. So I'll just um, start. They're short. Um, do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire. The women need dough to make sacrificial cakes for the queen of heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to provoke me to anger. But we will certainly carry out. So Jeremiah is correcting them, and they're saying, no, we won't do what you say, Jeremiah. But we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven. And pouring out drink offerings to her, just as we ourselves, our forefathers and kings, and our leaders did in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no misfortune. But since we stopped burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have met our end by the sword and famine. And said the women, when we were burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, was it without our husbands that we made for her sacrificial cakes of, in her image and poured out drink offerings to her? The reason I'm bringing this up, it does connect, is because there's a spiritual piece. And when somebody said Guatemala turned to Christ and the land produced, right, um, we have neglected neglected what has happened on the land before. I, I work with missionaries all over the world who don't know where they're walking and they don't understand what happened on the land prior. So in Oregon, we deal with this quite a bit, but I won't get into that too much because what my point in saying this is when we have a spiritual issue and we are coming up and butting against things, then we often don't know how to master and don't know how to pray. Um, and that's because I'm in a hurry. This was to be a practical thing piece too. Um, we're not willing, you know, and some would argue, but if there's equity in one thing of your life and you sit on it while other people have nothing, we have a problem. So I have, fr have had friends in Indiana who have 70 years of debt. They put their children's children in debt their family debts. They'll never be out of these farm debts. So she was a pig farmer. And why I'm saying that is because so many people have big mortgage, you know, mortgaged, or they were, they're gone, their, their mortgages are ended, but they're sitting on a huge piece of land. And then they have people around them, they have nothing. So what God is saying to our group is how are we to be creative with what we have? Yes. Where is our equity? How can we move our equity into the hands of others, paying off their debts so that they can then start building equity themselves? And, and the reason is because when we have that sharing understanding, when we have God's heart, then we can, and then we understand the spiritual aspect, what I just read, and we pray that God would literally forgive our debts you know, not just our salvation, our sin debts, but also our debt debts that bring us fear and intimidation and all those things. When we start to move with God's economy, when people move to shamanism, which they are constantly, there are short, there are movies on portals right now that are demonic. Um, so that whole portal piece was interesting to me. But my point in saying all this is there's, two aspects that we have to understand and and that how do we grasp grapple with those two things the practical and this spiritual side and understand what's happened on the land and how do we redeem the land entirely it's just my thoughts hey thanks for sharing that i think you're combining a few factors in here which is it's important to understand what's happened on the land the spiritual influences over the land uh, repentance for prior practices, 
you're also bringing up the fact that if we can help someone get out of debt, um, the Lord would want us to think creatively about how to do that. Um, that's the whole idea in the Bible between uh, a creditor who oppresses and a creditor who blesses. So a creditor who blesses is someone who gives uh, a loan. If you say someone has a debt that's in a financial institution, well, a way that people can help others is to actually give them a non-recourse, no interest loan to replace that debt. And in that way, they come out of slavery. And in that way, they can pay it down as they're productive. That's one way. That's one way we talk about with the storehouse. There's a whole bunch of ways. Uh, perhaps like what you're alluding to is if, hey, I own this farm, but you're indebted on that farm. Well, maybe you can farm a corner of my land if you if you have to not use your lands or what have you. I, I, you probably have better examples than that, uh, Lucien. But Lucien has a ministry called Rhea. It's based out of uh, in near Portland, Oregon. Um, they have unique struggles in in the state of Oregon there, but God has called each one of us to really deploy these biblical truths uh, out into the various communities and live like this and then be the hands and feet of Jesus, truly demonstrating God's economy, which is often sacrificial to Chris's point. And in that way, God gives us more. We make a sacrifice, God will give us more. Um, that's not a um, a relationless uh, ATM concept. That's a false understanding of that. It's a relational concept. It's like, I trust God. I, I fall into his arms. I, I give sacrificially. And then he increases, he blesses not only the person who received, but also uh, us because he's there constantly providing more and more. He's an endless well of supply. Um, thanks, Lucien. Don, go ahead. Don from Michigan. How are you, Don? So, wonderful. It's wonderful to see everyone. I'm just grateful. Every one of the words is obviously resonating. Everybody can hear the way the others are speaking and what they're experiencing. We're all very aware that God is tying this all together. It's interdimensional. It's interwoven. It's like a root system with the cedars of Lebanon or the, the, the great redwoods. I mean, this thing, it has intelligence. The king, this, this is this is a foreshadow a little bit. The kingdom of God is at play here. And, and what God has really been putting on my heart is this is really, we're starting to see shots over bow of the kingdom that is coming. Obviously, it's not going to come in its physical fullness until Jesus returns. But the bride is going to become the wife and the bride moving to the wife in Revelation involves the city of God. It involves new Yerushalayim, which says that's the mother of, of us all. We're born out of that city. Our citizenship records are there. Everything we do. So what does it look like when the kingdom of God, it comes, it's not just righteousness, peace, and joy. It's all that, but it also comes in power. What does that power look like? How does that involve the physical earth? Is the earth in Romans 8 really waiting for these huias, these mature sons of God, to actually have their feet and place on it to a degree? Ultimately, the kingdom that's coming is the millennial kingdom. We know there's total physicality involved and spiritual, completely perfectly joined. Well, what would we expect God to come if he's get, using us in a forerunner fashion to testify to the principalities and powers, the manifold wisdom of God, this is what it's starting to look like. There's a witness in the earth, almost like pockets all over that make up the bride who have the oil and the lamps without wrinkle. It's like he's, he's getting all the wrinkles out through this mammon, the greed, the avarice, all the self-sufficiency, all the doing my own thing. All that gets burned out. And where what is it going to look like a little bit? Well, it's going to look a little like Acts 2. God's going to do things. He does things the way he did things. We want God to so much do a new thing. He, we haven't even, God is reestablishing the foundations of what he's already done before the full witness comes. And what I see in, also in Acts, a couple things. I'm really hearing God pressing on these 50 days. Something has happened from first fruits up to Pentecost every single day. I don't know if you all are experiencing this. I'm sure you are. 
every day stuff is literally exploding relationships are connecting dreams and vision are coming god's giving you favor in advancing on, on what you're doing to connect to you and expand this and he's causing just the abandonment of everything the scriptures that deal with just forsaking everything to have this that's those violent men taking the kingdom by force that's every man pressing into it it's like you just have to have it it's like the air you breathe see it being seated in heavenly places is so real to us and there's fasting going on there there's some sort of fasting going on i i'm it, many people are in it we hear it but something about it maybe grant or others can speak on this but the but the feast coming up of pentecost there's a sense like you talk about chris talked about that that there's just going to be this a great explosion of souls and i just want to encourage us to seek god and press into him with others corporately in your groups on fasting in some form maybe not water own whatever people can do to enter in gearing up toward Pentecost and that 10 days of awe I think that Jonathan has spoken about and seen I think there's something really real there because I'm, I'm also experiencing the final thing that I want to say is in Mark chapter 10 where the rich ruler was told by Jesus he loved him and he said go sell everything maybe that was Barnabas and, and so then comes in this brief, these brief verses that Peter says, Lord, we've left. He says that nobody can be saved. If people trust in the riches can't get into heaven, then no one can be saved. And he, and he gives the famous words with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter says, we've left everything. We've left everything. We've left and Jesus says this, these words, and this has lands in it, not just countries, Lucien and others, you're experts with this. I'm a little bit of a student of the original languages, but this isn't, this is lands. And here's this promise of lands with persecutions. And I think it ties in also to Romans 8, where the creation is traveling. Yes, when Jesus comes in the millennial state, it's going to completely be there, but there's forerunners. His kingdom always with John the Baptist and, and this kingdom is coming with the spirit of the two witnesses. Yes, we're not them. We're not the fullness of them. We're not those. But there's something here about a, about a heralding of this kingdom. And what is this kingdom that's coming? It will come to the physical earth, take over the entire earth, completely transform it in everything. And I think what we're experiencing here is a forerunning, a shot over the bow of God of the kingdom that is actually coming. And it says here, Peter says, Jesus says there is no man this is so adamant meaning you can't find in god's mind you can't find an example of anyone who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake at the gospels but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time is that to get greedy no houses brothers sisters mothers children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life this kingdom is coming i think it is necessary it is because we sense god it is absolutely not only happening but is part of the qualification of the return of christ because the discipling of people involves the lands yes their countries yes their tribes yes their kindred but that involves lands and all of you are, God has given you something that is amazing and spot on. And I just encourage us to continue to expect God to entrust. If we've abandoned everything that God is going to entrust these lands more and more, but this, but the kingdom of God, and this is what we're experiencing in Myanmar and a couple places. It's like God overlays the kingdom, almost like the city of God, almost like a little microcosm of new Jerusalem on top of that land. And people are being protected. They're almost like little cities of Goshen at times, a dictatorship, one place where I'm heavily blood covenant tied to. So I want to encourage us. There are persecutions coming with this because the devil is not not just going to let us have all this without a fight because it's going to be the presence of God and there's going to be multitudes that God is going to touch and save. So that's yeah. what I want to say. Encourage you to fast in this season up until Pentecost. Amen. Thanks, Don. And hey, Don, I wanted to introduce you to uh, Kay and Dr. Susan. We've been trying to connect you guys. And actually, right before you joined, we were talking about this. Um, Susan, just briefly, um, go ahead and uh, share with Don for 
and everyone could benefit from this. Earlier in the call, we were talking about how can we come together locally. So Detroit, Michigan's included in that. Go ahead, Sue. <laughs> No, I just wanted to really introduce Don to Kay. Kay, Don was the one that was just speaking and he's the one that um, is, you know, in your area. And Kay has an issue that every single time it, it rains and the rain comes in from the, the east, Kay gets flooded in her <laughs> apartment and, and uh, she has, you know, she has no way to really, uh, she has to move everything and the curtains get soaked and she's constantly trying to um, solve the problem that way. But I, th but I think that she needs um, some assistance in seeing how that could be fixed. Um, it, that's, that's a great for sharing that need. Um, so hopefully we can help Kay one way or the other. Maybe you could introduce Kay as to, as to her person, her, you know, who she is and why you love her. <laughs> it's easy to love Kay. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I met Kay um, through a Jung, Young's call. I don't know if anybody, you know, if you guys know Young Kim, but he is uh, from Kansas City IHOP. And he met Kay a long time ago. And um, Kay's been a part of his life for a while as a mentor, as a, you know, as an apostolic uh, overseer of of his, you know, Bible study classes, she's an intercessor. She prays for those in the groups, and she's been um, a great friend and mentor to me over this last year. And uh, just don't, you know, she she has great discernment and and uh, really hears from God um, in terms of what to say, what not to say, when to say, not to say. She's very um, keen with that. And, you know, she just uh, freely gives of her time to people all over the, you know, all over the nation um, in terms of mentoring them and caring for them and stewarding them and catapulting them into the next level of their destiny when she gives a word or a prophetic word or a... Uh, an insight. So I just wanted um, them to to meet. Okay, do you want to say anything? Hope I didn't. The only thing you. I would say is thank you, Lord, because the words are from Him. But I think what I'd like to say, just my gratitude and the blessing it's been to be a part of the global prayer and meet such wonderful people and the Spirit of the Lord that just literally hovers over this prayer and what God is doing that perhaps we haven't even seen yet because he's kind of flying under the radar with certain things. But as he makes divine connections and like they said about everybody having a piece and a part, it's just stunning to see what the Lord has done. And I'm just so grateful and so blown out of the water by it the incredible people I've met through this group and it's just been a great honor and a blessing and uh hey. iron sharpens iron and uh it's been wonderful so I would well, say that. So, something um, must be happening in the spirit because Don is now in person shown his video <laughs> so Don what do you think <laughs> yeah when I show up in person there's a, there must be something happening the appearance is uh is appearance um, absolutely. And you know what, this just speaks of the fact that the village that God has us in the communities, we'll put it that way. This to me is just the kingdom of God. Everything is all this becomes an expression of the kingdom of God. So all the way that wherever we're at in a certain thing, there's nobody that's left behind. If they're a part of this and God has to add us to his body. We don't just get in because even if we, just because we want to be, I know that that challenges normal evangelistic uh, theories and all that. And the way people get saved here, hey, pray that it's, it's kind of like Zach, Zacchaeus said, Hey, I give half away to the poor. And if I've done anything, I restore people for Well, It's like, I just asked you to, to dinner, Zacchaeus. I didn't take you in a sinner's prayer. I just walked by you and you got up in a tree. Mm -hmm. So, so it's like, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, so how, if we could go on and on and on about how the scriptures look like this, as opposed to how we've, you know, made them to be, but Kay, we will definitely connect and, and get 
really also, it's like I, I have a particular love and care for all the family line. And I'm talking about the blood family as well as the blood covenant family people in our networks to, to see them come to saving faith. So I've pastored, I've church planted, da, 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 worked in the psychiatric field, all kinds of different things, all of us, financial field, all of these things, for what reason? It's to understand, I guess, the community so that you can relate with people. But I want, I want children. I want, I don't even care if they're ex-spouses. I want them all. And I've asked God to give me those heathen for the inheritance and in particular. So when we talk, it's going to be exciting to understand your history how things have come to where they are, where things have fallen through the cracks. And here's the beauty of it. It's not just a window that needs to be fixed. We get to end up entering into a relationship and let's see where the rest of this can go. Because if we're not, Amen. if God uses us, sister, if he uses you in these ways, how has that been neglected or fallen through the cracks? And maybe it's been because people have been around. There's a reason why we've gotten into debt, for instance, Greg, isn't it? There's a story how people have gotten into debt. There's people that have affected us and oppressed us. And there's decisions that unfortunately we've been forced into making or that we've made. God has a way on this. And I want to say, Kate, there are teams of people that can deal with windows that come and assist in widows and orphans in this area. It's very big. There's some folks that really do this and that's all they do. And they do it in nonprofit and other stuff full time. But in these days, we've got to have everyone involved in the Acts 2, Acts 4. I'm going to make a pitch for it again. It used to seem crazy, but guess what? This is where it's going. And now we thought, well, no, how yet? And all the excuses, we don't need excuses. The beauty, we don't need excuses anymore. So, okay, you and I will be connecting. And uh, now you see my face. So if I come knocking at your door, give you a phone no, call, don't. my phone number on there. So if you see the phone, if you see that phone number, you know it's me calling. Little old humble Don Carly from Detroit, Michigan. All right. Hallelujah. Shalom to all. This is great. Hey, listen, I look forward to we all Thank look you. forward to the Thanks. testimony. How you guys could work together. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Susan. And look, this this really was when, when Susan came to me and said, Hey, can we help Kay? And we we're talking about the New England storehouse to help Kay. I said, you know what will be better is to connect you with Don. He has the common fellowship and the common fund notions. These are the similar things. This is like a storehouse too. same principles. Let's yeah. connect those guys together because we, it would be better served if we helped seed something there than try to help Kay directly in, from our location. So I look forward Amen. to that. Amen. Sh share with us uh, further in the future about what's, what's going on. So thanks, Don. Absolutely. Amen. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Hey, that's great. Um, We've got uh, Stacy wanted to say something real quick, and maybe Stacy, you could pray us in conclusion today, unless there's something else someone wanted to bring up. Very importantly, we're kind of at the we're in the overtime now, but uh, God is good. Stacy, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure you knew that it was really short. I, I just a sentence. Okay, so when Greg started off the call, he said he had uh, was pondering when what the seven days after the actual um leaving egypt or you know taking off out of egypt what the actual seven days maybe was or what what was significant about seven days and he pressed in and he found he said he found that um that would be the time that they actually crossed over the red sea crossed through and so i just wanted to share um uh with greg that may 16th of this year, which is on um, the Hebrew calendar, it's Ayar um, 15. It says manna begins to fall. Um, it's Exodus uh, 16, one to four is the reading for that day. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so um, would you like me to pray now or did anybody else want to share, I guess, like you had left it open? Go ahead and pray. And if uh, someone wants to interrupt us, they can. Go go ahead, Stacy. Okay. Okay. So, Father, thank you for this rich, rich time you've given us. And I know you're going to transform even this time and these thoughts into um, filling us up uh, to understand our, our purpose and our destiny, our kingdom 
purpose, our kingdom destiny, uh, the poetry you've written on our lives, um, that you speak to us um, in your sweetness from you. Um, and, and you have it etched on your belly, um, your heart and your soul, uh, your mind of us. It's etched upon you. Um, even um, as our bridegroom, and I just, I just know you're you're going to fill us up. Um, that's what we're warring for right now is to um, to practically apply these uh, all these thoughts and all these unctions and all these um, arrows that you're giving us to move us forward. Um, you're, we're, we're going to um, press in and war for that and cross over and pass over to um, achieve that with you, to um, be like Don said, the, the, the brides that are carrying the oil, that are um, really poised and ready to go, um, bring more of us into that, fill up us, all of us here who have heard these words today, and then also give us the words to articulate them out around other people so that um, there is a real sense of warring and building for the kingdom, for our destinies and our purposes and the poetry written on us and the pure and spotless bride. Give us those words um, in our own ways, in the circles we move in, just like we were saying, building communities, and um, have us speak those words out uh, to, to motivate, inspire, and um, uh, push <laughs> and press um, in the crossing over. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Let us cross over, Lord. Hey, thanks, everybody. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Great discussion. Look forward to all of what God's doing in our lives. In Jesus' yeah. name, amen. Mm -hmm.